The annual Marx Autumn School is a joint project of Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, Helle Panke, Rosa Luxemburg Foundation Berlin, the Berlin Group Theory Organization Praxis, and the National Ums Ganze Network. Together we try to advance a reading of Marx and of Marxist theory that is both rigorous and undogmatic. After more than a century of uh, ignorant and opportunistic distortions, we are still pretty convinced that the Marxian analysis is essential to unlock the mysteries of a hostile social order that just won't go away. Far from collapsing under its own weight, capitalism continues to rejuvenate itself through crisis. Historic claims of an inevitable demise of capitalism by Marx himself, or even more so by his disciples, have been proven wrong over and over again. This year's Marx Autumn School focuses on a key concept of the historical narrative um, of Marxism on class. I cite, the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. Chapter 1, verse 1 of the Communist Manifesto of 1847-48. And class struggle was to be the war to end all wars. The proletariat, out of its own misery and coercion, would become the grave digger of the ultimate antagonistic society, the bourgeois society. And it would thus become the midwife of universal liberation, the liberation of mankind in a communist society. Now history has shown, and in fact rigorous and undogmatic reading of Marx itself shows, that it's not that easy. Class struggles have been absorbed by nation states. With increasing colonial wealth and imperialist power mongering, the proletarians of most lands aligned as national workforces and armies willing to kill each other on the battlefield. With the world market competition of enterprises and nation states becoming a second nature, this nationalization of the masses and classes continued through the epoch of social democratic welfare state and even more so during the current neoliberal era. Um, yeah, while deepening social divisions, the tri triumph of neoliberal capitalism and its current crisis regime have further deteriorated any notion of class struggle as a means of universal emancipation. And just an example of that is uh, the treatment of refugees here in Berlin that try to get the support of uh, unions and were sent away um, and were told uh, that unfortunately they were not workers. So the unions spoiled this chance to um, assist the wretched of the earth once more. <clears throat> so if that, quest to be, uh, of, of, if that quest of universal liberation is to be upheld, its key concepts need to be re-examined, including the notion of a historical and political subject of emancipation, a role once attributed to the proletariat. The place of the proletariat in the, histori in the historical narrative of Marxism remains vacant, despite ambitious contenders such as the precariat, the subaltern, or the multitude. In fact, this continued failure to identify and organize a historic subject of emancipation might indicate problematic theoretical and political implications of the narrative itself. This is where Dipesh Chakrabarti comes in. In his lecture, he will add another layer of critique, a post-colonial examination of implicit assumptions or biases of that universalist uh, narrative. The title of uh, his lecture is Rethinking Working Class, Postcolonial Perspectives on a Revolutionary Concept. Deepesh Chakrabarti is a leading ex exponent of postcolonial critique and a member of the renowned Subaltern Studies Collective. He is a professor of history, South Asian languages and civilizations and law at the University of Chicago. In Europe, he is most widely known for his study Provincializing Europe it investigates how the old continent serves as a, uh, I quote, tacit scale of historical knowledge. Uh, in this investigation, he draws from his own biographical and intellectual heritage uh, 
coming from a Bengali middle-class family in post-colonial Calcutta. Currently, he develops an integrated analysis of nature and history against the specter of climate change. A term some of you might be familiar with is the Anthropocene, a geophysical perspective on mankind. Tonight, um, we probably will not touch this last aspect, but um, we'll, we'll hear uh, his thoughts about the intricacies of the revolutionary concept of class. So his speech will be about an hour, and after that, um, everybody's free to comment or ask questions. And again, that's in German or English, whatever you like. So uh, please, Deepesh, go ahead, and um, we're going to listen. I'm also act very humbled by the invitation. And um, what humbles me is something that I was reminded of when Felix just mentioned that immortal sentence in the Communist Manifesto that the history of mankind hitherto has been the history of class struggle. And you will remember that later on, Engels actually added a footnote to qualify that sentence. And he said, all written history, that is. <laughs> that is, all written history of mankind has been a history of class struggle. And in that footnote, he clearly uh, evinced a tremendously shrewd, in the good sense, um, insight into the connection that's always existed between writing and inequality, which is why all written history is the history of class struggle. And I am somebody who inhabits writing, who is himself written, produced by my own writing, and in that sense, I'm acutely aware of the inequalities that actually make my own life possible. And, and therefore, I'm not an activist. My only public activism is in a place called the classroom. And I live for it. When I'm not in the classroom, I'm preparing to be in the classroom. Uh, and therefore, I always think uh, that I obviously belong to a parasitic form of life. Um, I, I survive because others do a lot more useful work than I do. And therefore, when I'm asked to speak to a gathering that is not exclusively or even predominantly about academics, I always feel I'm speaking to people who are far more important in this world than I am. Uh, and that's why that uh, little footnote of Engels that I was reminded of, that all written history is the history of class struggle, uh, is actually a reminder that all writing is based on inequality. Unfortunately, at least in this world, until now. Maybe one day it'll be different. But we're already going past writing. So in, in, uh, in America, actually, people talk about students um, and this problem of not, you know, in India, we have students who can't read because they come from families that can't read. In America, we have problem of students who can read but won't. <laughs> and that's a, that's a problem of a different kind. But what I want to do in this lecture is partly autobiographically and partly historically speak of the problem of class struggle and the problem of finding a revolutionary class as I encountered the problem in my lifetime in growing up to be an academic and as the problem is being posed by other thinkers in our time. Uh, so I myself came into Marxism in my uh, middle teens, high school years, actually. And by, before I went to the university, I knew that I was going to be a Marxist. And, and, but very fortunately, I think I came into a Marxism of the late 60s and the 70s, when because of the bad name that Soviet Union was getting as the lightning rod for all orthodox dogmatic uh, 
repressive, authoritarian forms of Marxism. What was happening in the Western academies, and we were influenced in India by uh, Western academies, mediated by what was being written in English, of course, was a tremendously fertile, the opening up of a tremendously fertile period about, on, of Marxism, of the cultivation of Marxism, during which the, I think the basic fundamental question that was opened up, which we found tremendously useful. No, oh, I didn't realize the lecture moves, so I can't lean on it. Um, what was very useful, the question that was opened up, is the question of determination. What causes what uh, in society? What are the main causes of social change? And the Soviet Marxism was tilted. It made the economic factor the most important causational factor. If you thought that the economic factor was the most important causational factor uh, in social change, in bringing about revolution, in bringing about socialism, then of course countries like India, like China, that had mostly peasants, where people were mostly peasants, mostly not workers, mostly poor, had no hope of actually transitioning straight to socialism without going through capitalism. So in countries like India for Marxists from the 1920s on, during colonial times, the question always was, should we go into capitalism and support our capitalist classes against the British? Or should we try to organize our workers, that tiny class of people, into a revolutionary class? Or looking at China, should we actually think of organizing the majority of our population, who are peasants, into a modern political force? But then this question was, can you create socialism with peasants who, are, who have not become workers, who have not become unionized, who have not become citizens in that sense? So one, this, if, you, if you think about the development in Marxism, very heterodox, very um, heterogeneous from the late 60s to the 80s, that is, let's say, from the kind of Marxism that Althusser was trying to bring about, the debates later on between the English historian E.P. Thompson and Althusser on questions of theory, uh, the translation of Gramsci's letters in 1971 that had a tremendous impact on people who wanted revolutionary Marxism but did not want Stalinism, um, going on to sort of the ferment of May 68 in Paris um, post-structuralism that comes out of that, Deleuze and Guattari's understanding of capitalism, there was a tremendously fertile um, sort of, this was a tremendously fertile process. And one letter I remember that get, got discussed a lot in these years was a letter that you might remember that Engels actually wrote in um, September 1890, 21st of September, 1890 to a man called Joseph Bloch in Konigsberg. And Joseph Bloch, I don't know, do, does anybody remember this letter here? No? Just shows how short our, I mean, this letter was very important as when I was growing up and important. Althusser actually discussed it. This was a letter in which Engels was explaining to this young Jewish socialist I mean, later on, Joseph Bloch would actually become a Zionist and would become, a, before he became a Zionist, he became a German socialist imperialist. He was one of those people arguing that Germany deserved a colony or colonies. But when he was 19 and he was the editor of a journal that came out of Königsberg called Der Socialistische Student, uh, he got this letter from Engels because he has written to Engels saying, is it true that Marxists must think that it's economics that determines everything? And Engels' letter begins by saying, Marx and I were so busy in our lives that we never had time to properly explain this question. 
economics or economy only determines things in the very last instance. And a lot of ink was built in the 1970s and 80s discussing what was the last instance and when did it come? When did you know that you were living in the last instance, on the last instance or at that moment? But what I'm saying is that there was this opening up of Marxism. This was also the period when analytical philosophers were producing um, rational choice Marxism. There was a man called Jerry Cohen who was a professor in Oxford producing in the 70s his book A Defense of Marxist uh, Theory of History. At the same time you had Ross Dolsky producing his interpretive textual notes on on, 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 on capital, reading capital. And Rostovsky, as far as I remember, was Ukrainian. And there was also this Soviet dissident Marxist, I.I. Uh, uh, Rubin, who wrote, who was actually murdered by Stalin in 1937, who wrote a tremendously important series of essays on Marxist theories of value that was republished in my youth by an obscure Canadian publisher. And, and that had a very deep influence, actually, on the work that is there in that book called Provincializing Europe. Um, and if you looked at, so you had historians Marxism, you had structuralist Marxism, Althusser was kind of quoting Lacan and Foucault uh, approvingly, but he was producing structuralism. Um, you had, uh, while Lacan and Foucault would go on to be post-structuralists, you had Foucault writing the foreword to Deleuze and Guattari's anti-Oedipus, saying that what these two people are producing is, an, is helping us to develop an anti-fascist art of living. So there was a tremendous ferment of a very rich, diverse left. And I often think that maybe it was because there was a Cold War going on. And Soviet Union stood for all that could be bad about Marxism, that people who didn't travel with Soviet Union were trying to actually, they felt free to discover other forms of Marxism. It was a cocktail. Things don't, didn't always mix. But I'm not saying people were tolerant of each other. I mean, it was in this period that two friends of mine, English friends of mine, um, Barry, Barry, Hurst, Barry Hindis and Paul Hurst, uh, wrote a book on socio-economic formations, which was a very Althusserian book. I don't know if any of you have read it, but it was again an important book in the debates those times. I have it on hearsay, so I'm not, I don't know if it's true, but I have it on hearsay that they stopped talking to each other while they were writing the book. But true to their commitments, they finished the book. And uh, so I'm, I'm not saying that people were friendly with each other. People seldom are at any period of human history. But we read different kinds of books. And one of the things that has, I think, dropped out of a lot of Marxist, Marxist discussion is the connection between interpretive, philological, textual, hermeneutic Marxism and the question of revolution. And I think the last text that I think of as written in the tradition, a very important essay, which actually turns on a philological reading of Marx is my friend Gayatri Spivak's essay, Can the Subaltern Speak? Which turns on a philological reading of certain passages in Marx. But what has become a more dominant form of Marxism after the end of Cold War um, is actually uh, uh, works by authors who consider post-colonials and post-structuralists to have betrayed Marxism and think of them as traitors. So one of the arguments I'm putting to you is that somehow during the Cold War, Marxism or Marxist literature or Marxist literature was like a very broad church. I'm not saying people were friendly, but the texts were not unfriendly to one another. Text was, we read all kinds of texts. Whereas now we go through a period where Marxists, and I'll come back to this, like let's say uh, Hart and Negri, uh, would consider post-colonials to have kind of 
gone up a wrong path of Marxism or gone up a wrong path that is not about resisting capital. And these divisions come later in the history of, of Marxism. Without this background of this extremely uh, uh, resurgent and interesting cocktail of partly academic Marxism, partly activist Marxism, I don't think we could have created something like subaltern studies, not to speak of postcolonialism. I'll come to postcolonialism in a moment. Subaltern studies, um, which was created by hi young historians interested in India in the 1980s, but comes out of these readings and debates of the 1970s, tried to mix Mao and Gramsci and structuralism and Rola Bath and uh, Ro Jacobson, uh, you know, the Tel Quell group, and all of those people eventually with some post-structuralism to write about peasant movement and to think of the peasant as a political agent in the third world. Now I have to give you a brief background to this. The, and this is where you can see why revolutionary Marxism rather than Frankfurt School or very kind of theoretical Marxism has always had a greater appeal outside of uh, the Western uh, democracies is this that in many ways if you read Western Marxist thinkers there's a deep assumption sometimes that the rest of the world has to become like us before they can be properly Marxist or before they can even be properly political. So subaltern studies began as a rebellion against a statement by the great, uh, since he became English by adoption, by the great English historian Eric Hobsbawm, who had made a statement in several of his writings actually, but made a statement in the 1950s after the war where he says, that the most revolutionary century in human history was the 20th century. Why? Because he said it was in this century that people who had nothing to do with modern institutions before, tribal people, peasants, indigenous peoples, had to deal with the modern state, either in the form of the colonial state or in the form of a, a, a new state, had to deal with mining companies, had to deal with modern business corporations and resist them, fight them, do what they could do. But having said that this was the most revolutionary century, he had done also said, but these protests by these people, the tribals, the indigenous, the peasants, were pre-political protests because these people did not understand the political language, the grammar of modern institutions. And therefore the implicit argument was that if these people were to be properly political, then they would first have to become, get de-peasantized, get de-tribalized, get de-indigenized, become urbanized, become workers. In other words, repeat the transition story in Western Europe. So, you know, if you look at the classical English story that Marx tells in Capital Volume 1, you, what you begin to get is de-peasantization through the enclosure movements of 16th, 17th and to the 18th centuries and the Industrial Revolution. So the, worker, so the peasants become uprooted, come to the cities, become workers, they become Luddites, they break machines, eventually they get unionized and as they get rights, like trade union rights, they also become citizens. So this story of transformation of the peasants into citizens was basic narrative of Western Europe. There was a very famous historian at UCLA, Eugene Weber, who wrote a book called From Peasants into Frenchmen. And he tells the same story. He actually tells maybe the government has to do something like colonial powers internally inside the country in order to modernize people. And subaltern studies began by rejecting that possibility. So we began by declaring, we didn't ourselves understand what we actually meant by it, but we began by declaring we don't believe Hobsbawm. We think peasants were political from be to begin with. 
The moment the peasant dealt with the modern state, the colonial state, the mining company, the colonial officials, they were political. And the peasants have the capacity to be a political subject. Now when I look back on this story of our thinking, of course we were influenced by Mao, and our methods were influenced by structuralism, but we brought Mao and Gramsci together. We were interested in Gramsci because Gramsci was talking about the southern question in Italy. And southern Italy seemed a lot like our problems. You know, peasants, uh, superstitions, religious beliefs. So if you think of a famous book, like Christ, Christ Stopped at, at Ebolai, um, uh, you get, um, like by Carlo Levi, the great Italian painter also, who was banished into the Italian countryside by uh, the fascists. And he writes about the peasants. And he discovers the peasants as superstitious, as irrational, as, as sunk into all kinds of ignorance. That's exactly the view that Indian middle class took of the peasants. And when we read Carlo Levi and we read Gramsci alongside, and we read Mao, we began to think, we don't have to repeat the story of the transition to capitalism of Western Europe. That we have some other story to tell, that our peasants can be modern. They can actually constitute a revolutionary force. That was the message of subaltern studies. But as I look back on it, I, I begin to see what happened. Was that we ourselves were part of a long history of people outside of Western Europe. People from countries where industrialization was underdeveloped, where the working class was small, trying to find a revolutionary class that would take the place of the working class and effect social transformation against all the odds, all the obstacles of economy, social structure, everything. So that's why you can see why Engels' letter of 1890 to Joseph Bloch was so important for us. Because it was saying to us that our institutional problems, our economic problems didn't have to be an obstacle. You know, and this is why the Leninist version of Marxism, where, which was basically avant-gardist, basically voluntarist, basically revolutionary, that does not wait for capitalism to collapse under its own weight of contradictions, which is what could at least you could think might happen in the more developed countries, where you could actually go past the capitalism to socialism. This question became very important. One of the texts, Marx's text, that became very popular, again published in the West, but became very popular in outside the West, was uh, published by a man called Theodore Shannon, who used to teach at the University of Manchester. Again, I think he was not English, but English by adoption. Uh, he published all the four drafts of responses that Marx, has, Marx had composed in response to a query from the great Russian socialist Vera Zasulich, who wrote to Marx saying, and this was in Marx's final years, wrote to Marx saying, do you think in Russia we can skip the stage of capitalism? and go straight to socialism on the basis of the village mere, the collectivity of the mere. The most interesting thing is, you know, this was, I would say, the first third worldist question in the 19th century, right? This is a question that anticipated what people in the third world would ask in the 20th century. And I find it fascinating that Marx wrote, if you go back to the book, Marx wrote four very long drafts. In the drafts, he actually allows for the possibility like populists in uh, Russia would in the 19th century, that you might be able to skip socialism because the peasant, the village mir, already had a sense of collectivity. It was not deeply atomized individualistically like in Western societies. But interestingly, he never mailed them. He never posted his drafts. The final letter he actually sent to Vera Zasulich was a few sentences saying, thank you for your letter. I'm just too ill to be able to answer it. Right? So in a way, a third world this question came up in the 19th century, and we have Marx's wonderfully staged silence about it. So we have a Marx who cogitated about it, who thought about it, and then decided not to make a public pronouncement. <laughs>
So the third world was born as this question that had interested Marx, but on which he didn't give a public answer. He only privately drafted letters. And that, those letters became very important for us. So if you think about it, from Bolshevik, if you think, if you go back, and I'm just giving you a very potted history. So you can, one can actually argue that Marx thought about the category proletariat before the category working class emerged. In other words, the working class was an empirical, sociological correlate to a philosophical category called the proletariat. So the proletariat, he deduced almost through a dialectical algorithm from his understanding of Hegel. So if you actually posed capital in his terms, then there would emerge a class at the other end that owned nothing except its capacity to labor. And therefore that had the dialectical possibility to negate capital. What happens is Engels, in 1844, writes the wonderful book called The Conditions of the English Working Classes in Manchester on the base of factory inspector's report. So suddenly, it looks like a philosophical category like proletariat actually has an existing sociological correlate, the working class. You can find it. So like, is it like, it's like the working class had realized the category proletariat. And I would say that a lot of 19th century in Western Europe was spent by people thinking that this working class would perform the role assigned to the philosophical category proletariat. It didn't. The working class fattened on colonial exploitation. Labor aristocracy developed. By the end of the 19th century, there were social democratic parties. People like uh, our Joseph Bloch actually then saying Germany should have colonies in the 20th century. And um, the search for a world historical revolutionary class moved out of Western Europe this romantic search, and was carried on for the 20th century by countries where industrialization was low and the working class was not present. So if you go back to the Bolshevik Revolution, apart from Leninist theory of the avant-garde revolutionary, professional revolutionary, Trotsky himself wrote about substitutionism. Or think of Lukács' theories of the party being the bearer of class consciousness. So these are all figures of substitutes. Then you come to the Chinese Revolution, the Vietnamese Revolution, you begin to get the figure of the peasant as a substitute for the proletariat. 1960s, Franz Fanon was, wrote this great book on the basis of his Algerian anti-colonial experience, The Wretched of the Earth. The expression, Wretched of the Earth, is actually a line lifted, just a phrase lifted out of a sentence in the famous, the international song, the international that communists used to sing. And it means exactly the proletariat. But Fano's whole argument was that the wretched of the earth was not the proletariat. So you get, and then we came up through Gramsci subaltern studies, subaltern. And I think the final, the final term in this series of substitutions, in this romantic search for substitutes for the proletariat, I think, is Hart and Negri's concept of the multitude. Because Hart and Negri defend the idea of the multitude precisely on the Hegelian um, uh, idea that here is a class that is adequate to its own times. But with Hart and Negri, we actually come to a problem that is of our time. Because if you remember why Hart and Negri go to the idea of multitude, is because they, re they recognize that the new subalterns of modern capitalism are not the traditional working class. They're not the traditional peasants. If you look at China and India, we have the emerging histories of urbanization, the formation of mega cities. People want to live in cities. The peasants' children don't want to be peasants. So peasantry as a class is finally dying in people. I mean, not empirically, they're still there, but they're kind of, you know, uh, sociologically being transformed in India and China and other places. So they, and they look at all these illegal migrants, boat people, refugees, and Hart and Negri register, and I agree with their uh, gesture there, that this is the new class. But in saying that, then they begin to say, 
that what this class needs then, the most revolutionary demand, would have to be the demand for right of passage, that everybody should be able to go wherever they want to go. And that is the demand on which we should fight. In other words, if we go back to capitalists and say to them, just as you want capital to be free in its right of mobility from one place to another, we want the other factor of production, labor, to be as free in its right of mobility. And their assumption is that if we get this right, then capitalism will collapse under the burden of its own contradictions. So they actually recognize this. But at the same time, they criticized people like us, not so much me, but Homi Baba, as the typical post-colonial icon, for what, if it is with these people that you begin to get the objection that the post-colonials have moved away from Marxism and have become the, and have become unwittingly or wittingly available uh, for the service of capital. And this is how the argument goes. I'll quickly recapitulate the argument of Hart and Negri and then go on to speak a little bit about what Postmodernism did, speak a little bit about Homi Baba's very current response to Hart and Negri and then come back to the conclusion of this talk. So um, the, the criticism that these people made, Hart and Negri and others, of the use of post-structuralism of Derrida and Lacan and Deleuze and Guattari by the post-colonial lefties. And you have to realize that either with post-structuralism or with post-colonialism, you know, in the early years when these fields are born, there is no right-wing post-colonialism. There is no right-wing post-structuralism. I mean, it all comes out of the left. I mean, they, are, they come as fellow travelers. When Homi Baba wrote his first piece called The Commitment to Theory, if you read that piece, it's in the book, The Location of Culture, he actually talks about socialist politics, the expression that they, in the British context. But what Hart and Negri criticize, and what is the criticize that, criticism that sometimes comes from David Harvey and other people, is that they felt that all these people who helped us to think about difference, Levinas, Derrida, Lacan, the, and the post-structuralists, people who, whom we call philosophers of difference, theorists of difference, they think that these people land us, take, it, uh, take us into a blind alley, or even worse, make us kind of subservient to the logic of capital for this reason. And their argument is this, that capital succeeds and goes everywhere by converting difference into preference. In other words, capital succeeds by making our sense of how we are different from one another, how I might be Bengali and you might be German, by making that difference available as a consumer choice. So I will go to a shop and I'll say I'd rather have a toothpaste made by a Bengali manufacturer. I mean, and I would have to mean Bangladeshi because that's where most Bengalis are. Uh, in my case, and I'll say I'd rather not use an American toothpaste. But, they, but, but if that's what difference is, if difference is simply there to be made into preference, that is a consumer choice, then entire theories of difference are only, only uh, servicing capital. And there are two problems with this argument. One is, of course, that Hart and Negri never considered, never stopped to consider, that there are lots of differences in the world for which there are no markets. So even if I wanted to use a Bengali toothpaste, I wouldn't find one. <laughs> because not all differences are equally marketable. We can't, we can't make all our differences. Some of the differences, I mean, they, one could argue that if one pushed the logic of difference in the same way that one pushes the logic of migration, one would also bring the logic of capitalism to a crisis, if one could. But the more important point is, why did the question of difference arise in post-colonialism, in globalization literature of the kind that Arjuna Padurai and others produced? Why was difference so important? You see, and you have to realize that in choosing to talk about difference, globalization theorists, and particularly post-colonial theorists, were recognizing that post-colonialism was born as part of Western democracies. They were not born in the anti-colonial theaters to begin with. And they were born in a dialogue with, and in conversation with, and in opposition to, many of the things that Western theorists, particularly German thinkers, had said during the Cold War and before. 
So if you look at people like, of course, Heidegger, but also Jaspers, Gadamer, Carl Schmitt, uh, you look at them think and follow their thinking into, um, into the 1950s after the war, in the atomic age, in the space age, you will think that a lot of them had this fear, Adorno included, a lot of them had this fear that instead of the world coming together on the basis of genuine intercultural understanding, in other words, where cultures were meeting on the grounds of self-confidence, the world was being brought together more by technology. And it would make the world so uniform that, would, that, that whether you looked at capitalist technology or you looked at Soviet technology, we would be f absolutely facing the nightmare of the uniform, uniformated, uniformized human being. It's like Heidegger's Dasman, Jasper's mass man, Adorno's fear of mass culture, Gadamer's fear expressed in the 80s that this is what was happening in the world. The idea that A, we did not represent authentic self-contained cultures, you know, that I don't always have to be fully confident of being a Bengali or an Indian in order to meet with you because there's nothing called essentially Bengali. This idea was actually promoted in the 80s in difference with this whole line of German, very influential line of thought. And that we had to think of difference, not in terms of essences, but we had to think of difference philosophically in such a way where we could both acknowledge difference, but not make difference into a fixed essence. And this came out of the struggle in Western countries, in France, in England, and other places, with what I call post-imperial racism. Now, post-imperial racism is the kind of racism that developed in these imperial countries once the colonies started to collapse. And there were, people have now documented it, like groups like La Pen in France was started by ex-colonials moving back to France. And a lot of you know, during British times, there's, an, there's a, something very amusing I find in Indian history as a historian of India, that if you look at Indian students' account of the British before our independence and before the war, before the Second World War, most Indian students went to England and genuinely came back with happy experiences. They didn't encounter much racism. And most Indian, many Indian students, very famous Indian students, including our first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, developed this theory that there were two kinds of Englishmen, good ones and bad ones. The good ones stayed back at home, the bad ones went out to the colonies. And Niraj Choudhury, Tagore, Nehru, a lot of people came up with this theory because actually what was, what was British racism was a post-imperial racism. And post-colonialism was dealing with this question of difference in an age of migration, skilled migration, unskilled migration, but both fighting post-imperial racism as well as fighting the inheritance of very influential line of European thinking which thought that the kind of difference we were seeing in the world after the 1950s was really a production of masses. And you know the whole field of cultural studies comes out of a rebellion against Adorno's criticism of mass culture. And and, and that was the role in which difference was being played. But what I find, but where the shared ground, shared ground is between, let's say, Homi Baba's colonial, post-colonialism, Arjuna Padurai's globalization, and Hart and Negri's writings on the multitude, is that they all are forced to acknowledge a particular reality, which is that the new subalterns, the new deprived class of today, is not a substitute for the proletariat. We don't find a revolutionary class. We find a deprived class, and that's why, and they, they are classes that basically live. They're not always migrants, illegal migrants, but they're people who basically live precarious forms of life. In other words, people who are at the service of capital, sometimes as illegal migrant laborers, sometimes as legal but badly paid laborers,
sometimes as legal, highly paid, but insecure laborers. So what David Harvey wrote about flexible accumulation, I think, was right. In other words, the logic of accumulation of capital has changed, changing the nature of work and producing thereby forms of insecure labor, both at the white collar level and at the blue collar level, and then at the absolutely where the horrible, the horrible figure of deprivation who is the refugee. So most countries um, in European thinkers are actually written a lot about it. Uh, Etienne Balibar, my friend Sandro Mizadra from Bologna, they've done wonderful studies and you can actually find on the internet the maps showing detention camps for illegal immigrants that European countries have produced, you know, this whole idea of fortress Europe. And these detention camps run into hundreds and they spill over into North Africa. They're outside of Europe as well. And Balibar made a wonderful statement. He said, you know, there was a time in the 19th century when Europeans made it their business to convert everybody's frontiers into borders. And now they're turning all borders into frontiers. <laughs> With all these detention camps are like frontiers where the border of Europe is running through them, even when they're outside of Europe. And that, I think, is a fact that is recognized both by Hart and Negri and by, on the other hand, by the post-colonials, that that is where the biggest change is. What I find also fascinating is that Baba has tried to respond to Hart and Negri by saying that while you guys have this vision completely fixated on mobility, you know, the same Baba who once said the migrant has the truest eyes turns to Hart and Negri and said, you think that people just want to move from one place to another, but people actually want to settle. They want citizens' rights. They're surviving. They're developing arts of survival, but they want welfare. They want rights. They want to settle down. They want to become citizens. And we are in this peculiar moment when we know that capitalism has gone, global capitalism has taken a form where it's fundamentally changed the nature of work so that even highly paid employees have insecure lives in terms of permanence of employment. And therefore you have, people have tried to develop the notion of a precarity, the precariat, knowing that the precariat is not the proletariat, it doesn't even take the function of the proletariat, and trying to think of, work out what could be the politics of emancipation in this case, where, and here I touch just slightly on my recent work on climate change and planetary crisis, at a stage when even when, here's the dilemma, that even when I'm asking for citizenly rights and benefits for every people, at a time when the world now is poised to have 12 billion people, the most recent UN estimates have revised the estimate upwards. So that once the idea was that by the end of the century we'll have 10 billion people, now they're saying it'll be 12. Africa will have a population boom because of certain kinds of development. We are not even sure that the benefits of capitalism, even as they are, can be generalized to such a large number of people. But even when we are not sure that that can be done, our normative horizon still comes from the discourse of rights and citizenships, and that's where the emancipatory language comes from. And we live in times where there is increasingly a decalage between our normative horizons and the empirical developments in global capitalist order. So let me then finish going back to the person we are remembering through all our discussions uh, here. Uh, that is Marx, the old Marx, who doesn't go away, like capitalism. Capitalism may not look like it's going to go away soon, but nor is this old man going to go away soon. He'll always be there making us think and making us actually think about a situation where thinking seems impossible. And so, so you know, one of the insights of Deleuze and Guattari was uh, that when something new really happens in the world, a new possibility that you would be welcoming of, it's very hard to detect the new as new because they argue theoretically 
that the new comes in the form of a disguise and through the mechanism of subterranean sly displacement. So the new always looks like the old. And here is how the old man Marx thought about it a long time ago. Newness enters the world as a challenge to judgment, our political judgment, and therefore the law. Political judgment is always tied to the old because it comes from how we've been trained to think of the norm. It is <coughs> Marx in a moment of reflection on this problem of repetition and resemblance in history and thus on the figure of the belated what comes late and looks like merely a repetition so that the precariat may look like it's a repetition of the old proletariat. Um, and you know, there's, there are good reason, uh, anyway, I'll, maybe we'll pick it up in the discussion, why it may look like that. So Marx, in a moment of reflection on the problem of repetition and resemblance in history, and thus on the figure of the belated, put his finger on the necessary disguise of the new. The lines are very well known, indeed, but may bear repetition in the context of this discussion. Let me give Marx the final word. Well, I'll never give Marx the final word. I have to quibble, so I'll end with the quibble. But let me give him almost the semi-final word, almost the final word, with one minor quibble. And this is Marx. And these are words you know, but I'm repeating them. Men make their history, but they do not make it just as they please. The tradition of all the dead generations weighs like a nightmare on the brain of the living. And just, as, and just when they seem engaged in creating something that has never yet existed, they anxiously conjure up the spirits of the past to their service and borrow from them, that is from the spirits of the past, names, battle cries, and costumes in order to present the new scene of world history in this time-honored disguise and this borrowed language. Now Marx, of course, expected this process to have a happy Hegelian ending. He said, a beginner who has learned a new language always translates it back into his mother tongue, which is not true. But he has assimilated the spirit of the new language and can freely express himself in it only when he finds his way in it without recalling the old and forgets his native tongue in the use of the new. We are probably rightly suspicious of happy endings to human history. But we remain interested in remainders and failures of translation that always come back to haunt and trouble what translation achieves. Yet Marx here himself acknowledges that the new in politics often deceives us as the language of the old. And therefore, if I could bring into conversation with Marx, another German thinker, rightly hated by many, but again, like a figure, even if he's a figure of hatred, he's not going to go away. That's Heidegger. And there's a sentence in Heidegger where Heidegger said, what is most difficult to do is to hear that which I do not already understand. So I'm suggesting that when, when we think of the precariat, when we think of what's new and where the possibilities of emancipation are, we need to do that work of opening ourselves up so that we could hear that which we do not already understand. And in that sense, the new always befuddles judgment. Thank you very much for your question.